The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by the Clean Power Consulting Group. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Check out all of our content at cleanpower.group forward slash podcast. Please give us a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. That helps others find this content. Today on the Clean Power Hour, using flexible computing to avoid curtailment of renewable energy. My guest today is John Belazare. He is the CEO and founder of a company called Soluna Computing. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks for having me, Tim. It's a pleasure. It is a fascinating world, this world of data centers and renewable energy power plants. And I look forward to bringing this story and uh, solution to our listeners. Give our listeners a little bit of background on yourself, John, and why you started Saluna. Well, thanks for that introduction, Tim. Uh, I like to say that I'm I'm not an energy guy. I actually uh, started my career in the enterprise software space, uh, helping large enterprises solve big business problems using uh, innovation, software innovation primarily. So I started my career at Intel and uh, quickly transitioned into becoming an entrepreneur. I have about 20 plus years experience um, I've been saying that for about five years, so maybe it's about 25 years at this point, <laughs> uh, building uh, innovation-driven uh, companies, catalyzers really, in different markets, uh, starting e-commerce, uh, transition to uh, incubating companies and getting them kicked off into the venture world and uh, moved into the insurance underwriting space, so automating insurance underwriting and about four years ago, a mentor of mine uh, introduced me to the in, the renewable energy industry. They had a uh, large uh, power plant in Morocco, southern Morocco, that was uh, stranded. It was able to produce about 900 megawatts if it could be connected to a grid, but there was no grid to connect it to. <laughs> and so they had to think about how to create a uh, vertically integrated solution where the you can monetize the power until the grid arrived. And that was intriguing to me because they they were interested in connecting blockchain and blockchain computing to that problem. And so I spent the first two years of the last four, four years working on that project, uh, getting it developed, and ultimately running into an interesting development where the grid did make its way over the, pro the project and the computing evolved to uh, being an embedded off-taker to really being a demand response solution for adding large amounts of, re of intermittent power to a growing economy and a, and a developing grid system uh, in the country. Right around COVID, we decided that uh, it would be challenging to keep going back to Morocco since no one was flying anywhere. And the concept for Saluna Computing uh, became clear to us. What if we took this computing solution that we architected for that project and took it to existing projects that had a stranded power or curtailed uh, power problem. And over the course of six months of research, we determined that not only was it a real problem, it was a big one, and this could be a novel solution to it. That's my, that's my full journey, um, hailing here from New York, <laughs> uh, enjoying uh, doing all sorts of amazing things, building power plants, uh, uh, helping build power plants with computing. It does seem like there's a trend. I have noticed several of my colleagues in renewable energy moving into the computing space, the blockchain space, and mm -hmm. now vice versa. Of course, you know, data centers are popping up like mushrooms on uh, on our grid and, and on our built-in infrastructure just because data is the new oil in some respects. <laughs> there are mm -hmm. many new oils. But um, so let's let's drill down a little bit on your business model and i mean most energy professionals are familiar with this concept of there being excess energy from a facility and then that energy is dumped and uh, sometimes the price of that energy goes negative and and so you are seemingly taking advantage of that phenomenon in you know i i'm less familiar with wind i'm very familiar with solar how in the summer we get a tremendous amount of of generation and for behind the mm -hmm. meter applications it's common to uh design the system to overproduce mm -hmm. uh, a front of the meter would be 
front of meter solution would be different, but um, what is the, do you, do you differentiate? Do you, do you target specific sectors within renewables mm -hmm. and then where explicitly, like what states or what ISOs are you targeting and working in? Great uh, question. Thanks for setting me up for that. We, so we, we, um, we focus on wind, uh, solar, hydro are the three focus areas for us. We have seen just about everything, everything from where um, you have, uh, you know, different parts of the season where there's extra hydro and the grid uh, operators don't know what to do with the power. And they're really trying to uh, retire these um, uh, the, these gas-fired uh, uh, generation systems, et cetera. So we'll go in and uh, build a facility that integrates to the grid that comes online in certain parts of the day where that excess may be available. So we've done that a few times. We work with wind uh, projects and wind power plant owners that have lots of curtailment due to overgeneration or congestion, depending on where uh, their project is located on the grid systems in Texas, for example. And uh, we go in and help them uh, mitigate that curtailment. And for solar plant owners, uh, we've seen projects all over the country and a uh, similar issue where, uh, depending on where the power prices are, if they start to drop below zero, you start to see that facility go, go offline. What we do, um, I like to paint a picture where you know, uh, I'm in a I'm in a, a white pickup truck. <laughs> I show up to the power plant. You know, the Saluna logo is on the side, and I say, "Hey, I noticed that the you know those turbines aren't spinning very much." And they say, "Well, yeah, because we can't get our power to the grid because there's all this congestion." And I say, "Well, if you give me a certain amount of acreage, I will build uh, this flexible computing facility right here. It'll integrate to your." Uh, GSU or your 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 power plant substation that makes its way up to the grid, and when you are signaled to curtail, you go ahead and keep generating, and I will monetize that power for you. And I basically take those what would otherwise be wasted electrons and convert them into clean, green, low cost computing for a host of different applications. Uh, what we call batchable computing, things that are flexible in nature that can live in an, a less than 24 seven available environment, they're you know, intermittent uh, environments. And through that, uh, we deliver a solution that is a combination of physical interconnection into the facility. So we become a combined resource to some extent from the grid's perspective. Um, our load is flexible. So uh, when you do need to generate, we are able to scale our uh, consumption down. And we also, pair that with a financial or structuring solution that allows the project to integrate with your power plant, fit within the uh, realm of different law or protocol frameworks, um, uh, financial settlement, uh, project, fi project finance, uh, supporting the unlocking of your PTCs and RECs. All of that is part of the package, if you will, that we've sort of figured out, and it's uh, quite turnkey. And it's a three-step model. First step is we do a curtailment assessment. So we determine how much of your power has been wasted over several years. And we can determine a revenue effect on that. And then we simulate and show you what happens when we add our facility and how much revenue recovery you can make. And then we put together a proposal, um, build a partnership, and then we build, uh, we structure, build, and operate the facility so you don't have to do anything in that regard. Um, and Tim, to answer your question in terms of location, um, we have a, uh, over a gigawatt of pipeline now with some of the top uh, IPPs in the world that have assets in Texas. Uh, so ERCOT, uh, we're looking at SPP. We've looked at projects in, in, in uh, the Northeast uh, as well, in Canada. And we have uh, projects uh, that are maturing in Europe as well. And this concept of flexible computing I don't know how familiar people are. So could you give us a couple of concrete examples of large uh, applications that, that leverage this type of computing or are relevant to this type of com computing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one example is today, 
probably a lot of the listeners are, are Netflix uh, uh, members or subscribers, although they've had some reduction. Maybe you used to be and you're no longer <laughs> a subscriber. Um, in any case, uh, you watch shows there. And then as soon as you, you, you're, you're done watching that show, it starts showing, showing you a new one or it shows you suggestions about what show to watch next. That recommendation engine is actually a very large process that runs. It takes all of the movies you've watched, it determines what bucket to place you in, and that allows them to model you as a, as a, as a watcher and start showing you more shows that you might like. That is a batchable process. It can run continuously for you. It doesn't have to run in real time. As long as they're sort of in the bucket, they can generally be showing you more movies. But as you watch more movies, they want to update your profile and that get kicked that gets kicked off. And there's a process that runs in the background that becomes a supporting process for the Netflix system. The process that shows you the movie and streams the movie to you, that's a core system and very critical system to Netflix. And it has to run continuously so that you can see those movies uh, when you hit play, it does play, right? So that's the difference mm -hmm. with, between real time and non-real time or batchable processes. Another example is uh, think of a large pharmaceutical company. The world breaks out in a pandemic. They have to search <clears throat> through a number of, of uh, molecules to determine what molecules might have a mitigating effect on the symptoms related to COVID or some other big vir viral outbreak. That's a big computing process these days. It used to be done in the lab, and now there's been lots of developments uh, where you know the, the model of the molecule is stored in a computer, and they can then model the virus, and they can actually do tests to determine applications of that molecule to that environment. Um, I'll give you one more. Uh, think about a large financial services company that needs to mark all of its investments to market, especially in, in the most recent weeks when we're since we've been taping here. And that process runs in the background. It's a batch-oriented process that has to remark all of its investments such that it can rebalance its books and investments over time. That's also being run in, 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 in a batch format. So the, the whole idea is that um, if you take the big sort of hyperscale market and you sliced off a uh, a slice of pie, if you will, um, there would be this pie that was just these batchable applications. We think that's somewhere around 20% of the whole market and it is the fastest growing slice of the pie. It's, be it's quickly becoming a big uh, portion of the total pie. What we're doing is uh, building a data center business that can focus on those. Um, and of course, the last example is uh, is uh, things like crypto or or, or uh, Bitcoin mining. Those are all compute intensive applications as well, also flexible in nature. So great applications in this space. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like you have two businesses. You're looking for IPPs, energy developers, asset owners that have potential issues with curtailment, yes. and then you are looking for companies that need computing services. That seems like two very different worlds. Is is that the case, that you basically have two businesses? It is. To some extent, we're sort of a, a, a dual-sided company, right? Almost a marketplace, <clears throat> eventually, where we're selling cloud services to you know large enterprises, and we're building these facilities, and and uh, running them and operating them. So we're very much a data center company, but our the the energy portion of our business is to some extent vertically integrated, right? We're, we're, we're integrating back into the source of the energy and using that integration to actually create a new solution for that industry. So we're not just a data company, but we're a data a company that, a data center company that is creating uh, a clean tech solution that can accelerate renewable energy development. That's the exciting thing that we're taking something effectively that exists today. We're, 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 you know, sort of tweaking it. Right. So we're saying our facilities only do this type of processing and our facilities live behind the meter with 
renewable power plants in remote areas that um, have lots of power plants and they live around the world where renewable energy needs to grow and expand, thereby significantly increasing the percentage of renewables in the world. So yes, we it, it's a two-sided industry ultimately, but it could have massive mm-hmm. effects on the space. And it's, you know, it's very scalable. Like if you compare our computing business to batteries or transmission, first of all, it's available today, right? We're taking something that is is commercially available and we're bringing it to an industry that only sees those two other solutions as the only solutions to this problem. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Clean Power Hour or viewing it on YouTube. We do have a great YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed, please go to cleanpower.group and hit that YouTube icon and subscribe to our channel. Of course, you can find all of our content on your favorite audio platform as well. So please give us a rating and review. Back to the show. And how big is the crypto market for you? Crypto, of course, is in the news a lot. And I think that it does have a bright future, albeit a rocky future uh, in the near term. And yeah. but does does the world embracing crypto truly in, increase our need for computing power? Good question. So uh, cryptocurrency and the promise of that technology, which is to transform the financial services industry, is already underway. If I liken it to where the internet started when I really started my entrepreneurial career, there were lots of doubts about the potential for the digitization of just about everything to society, businesses, etc. And now, 20 plus years later, it kind of would be challenging for one to ask, like, what's the role of the internet? And not have people look at you like you're crazy, right? <laughs> you know. I sometimes I walk down the street and I see a phone booth and I'm like, oh my god, look at that! You know, it's a phone booth. <laughs> Whereas I have a supercomputer in my pocket, powered by the internet, that allows me to do just about everything and talk to anybody in the world. When it first started, that innovation and its potential wasn't readily clear to everyone. Uh, crypto has the same characteristics. It's built on top of the internet. It's really focused on digitizing. Uh, the concept of money, it has evolved to digitizing just about everything else. And that does require lots of computing power because um, what you're doing is essentially creating assets that have value or creating systems for people to store assets that have value. And those, uh, those platforms need to be protected because there's a security concern there. And the computing is used to provide that security. So you'll have lots and lots and lots of machines and facilities around the world, making it seamless for you to use these platforms without really thinking about the security anymore. Using the internet as an example again, you know, you and I are are interacting over this digital platform. We're in completely different parts of the country. We don't even think about all the different underlying things that have to happen at a, you know, network level for that to happen. That's what's that's what's going to happen with crypto, where you'll have this infrastructure out there. If what we're doing is successful, not only will that be the case, but you'll have these computers placed with renewables as a way to catalyze uh, those facilities. So there'll be power plants that are built that otherwise would not be built, uh, essentially achieving additionality because uh, this type of data center is now combined with those resources. That's a very exciting thing for us, and it's being made possible by this whole movement in crypto. But I got to tell you, uh, all of the computing, your, your point earlier, that is more data focused. We're, we're creating massive amounts of data, and that is creating a whole new industry that can also live in those facilities. And that will help to drive this 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 renewable energy growth over time. So, uh, so I guess the answer to your question is uh, yes. Com- you know, uh, crypto is making computing uh, accelerate, but so is everything else. Computing is sort of so central to society these days. Yeah, and meanwhile, we're electrifying everything, transportation, and everything in the built environment. So we're going to triple 
the amount of electricity that modern civilization uses on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So we need a lot more energy on the grid. So mm -hmm. it seems like a both and, so to speak. Right. Uh, when you when you look at the landscape, though, of opportunities, you know, in energy and computing, mm -hmm. is is there anything else about that space that makes you uh, go, oh, there's an opportunity here, and and I and I know that this is this is a, a dicey question for you, and we're about to wrap up, but uh, yep. yeah, I'm just curious where what else do you uh, or keeps you up at night? Well, I think that um, when I look at our business and, and, and as I learn more about the grid and how it works and how power development is happening, I think the key thing that I focus on is educating the industry uh, to rethink infrastructure. Um, today, we only see certain classes of technology as potential additions to infrastructure. If I say the word data center to everybody, they just think of it as load. They think the grid is is servicing that uh, system. Is you know the grid is servicing the data center. But what if you flipped it around and said, you know, can the data center service the grid? You'd have to think about a whole new type of data center that's uh, more flexible, um, thermodynamically uh, different, integrated with renewables. It's completely different. That's what we've done here. And I think that what keeps me up at night is how do we scale that? How do we how do we drive massive adoption of that solution? Because it's a solution that can help address some of these challenges today. Rather than building giant hyperscale facilities that to some extent subsidize uh, fossil fuels, even if you go out and buy a power plant, doesn't help you by the way, um, you're not increasing or helping the flexibility, the, the resiliency and the uh, you know resiliency and the scale of the grid. So this is a potential uh, to do that. Yeah, it's it's demand response at a at a grand scale. That's right, exactly. You're using basically a phenomenon that's already taking place to solve a problem that's essentially acute at this point, right? If we want to make a transition, we need something that's scalable and available to help the grid today not five to 10 years from now. Very good. Well, you can find all of our content at cleanpower.group forward slash podcast. Please give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify and hit that YouTube icon and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank John Belazare for coming on the show today. He's the CEO and founder of Soluna. John, how can our listeners reach you? Uh, our website is a great resource for learning about the company and our technology and our team. That's salunacomputing.com. And if you're a big uh, person and you're on social, uh, follow us on Twitter. We're at Saluna Holdings. And uh, we're also on LinkedIn. Go to the Saluna Computing or Saluna page on LinkedIn. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And I'm Tim Montague. Let's grow solar and storage. Have a great day. Thanks, Tim.